Welcome everybody to the uh, third episode of our um, Goat Camp series that we are in the midst of doing with the uh, Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance. And tonight is our um, segment where we've brought on some very experienced uh, goat hunters um, in the form of a couple of guides that we have lucky to have tonight you can tell us some interesting stories and uh, a couple of really dedicated diehard goat hunters so we're going to go around the horn and uh, just do um, ask each of you to do a quick brief intro and then um, we're going to cover a few things tonight we're going to have some discussions on um, lessons learned on the mountain talk about some of our favorite moments uh, goat hunting equipment gear all that fun stuff so we're going to try and cover as much as we can so maybe we'll start with the father son duo up in the corner of the screen there if you guys want to maybe start marvin you can uh, give us a little intro sure so i'll start with uh, with myself i'll probably keep the intro a little shorter than the other night uh so marvin kwiatkowski uh we're in uh, southern part of bc uh, basically just outside of kamloops um been on Goat Alliance, it's been two years now as a director, and then more recently in the last six months as the uh, chair, uh, board chair. I've been goat hunting since mid 90s, um, pretty much every year, um, pretty much the same amount of days each year. I just kind of hunt differently, which we'll probably get into that a little bit more. Uh, so yeah, I can do between 10 and 20 days, uh, sort of chasing some goats. Uh, I have never guided, but take lots of guys out. Uh, I'm big on the mentorship component. Um, as well as education in general uh, with uh, with people I bump into and get to know. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of my passion. I uh, love goats, probably my favorite, definitely my favorite animal to hunt. And I'll pass it over to my boy here, Caden. All right, um, Caden Kwiatkowski. Um, last year started guiding and this year went up to Northern BC. It was my second season, had a great season up there. Um, avid hunter. I've uh, been spending over 100 days in the field the last two seasons, um, and yeah, I just love being out there. It's awesome. All right, Ed, you're right below these guys. You're next. Okay, uh, yeah, grew up all in the outdoors, hunting, fishing, trapping. Um, did my first mountain goat hunt when I was eight years old, and been hooked ever since. Um, I don't hunt nearly as much as I used to uh, you know family and responsibilities and stuff have kind of taken toll but I definitely get out there and look at them and talk about goats and take pictures and all that stuff still and when the chances permit I do get out but uh, hopefully that'll change in the future here as my daughter gets older we'll get out and do some more but uh, anything mountain goats I'm I'm ready to jam <laughs> yeah right on awesome thanks Ed Nolan Hey, yeah, I'm Nolan. I, I live in North Vancouver and uh, I've been a resident of BC for, I guess, 10 years now and guiding or guiding and wrangling for the last nine uh, in the Yukon a little bit and then mostly up in, in the northeast of BC with the horses and stuff, do a little bit of back backpack hunting as well or backpack guiding and, and then hunting and yeah, I just love to hunt and get out as much as possible and I'm just trying to see if I can keep up with Marvin and Ed here yeah yeah no doubt those guys are uh pretty pretty serious dudes to try to chase around i can only imagine so yeah well nolan uh, while you got the mic um tell us a little history on goat hunting for you obviously been guiding like you said for several years now um mm -hmm. you have uh you have a, a goat hunt that's been filmed and we do want to touch on that maybe throughout the uh throughout the episode um tonight and uh I just want to say that is that is an awesome film and it really um it really brings to the surface the challenges of especially winter goat hunting from terrain mm -hmm. to weather just mental physical all that so maybe if you could just tell us a little bit of a, your history on goat hunting and how you ended up uh, on the mountain on that show yeah okay i haven't thought about this one in a while i think I think the first goat hunt I ever did might have been in December. <clears throat> I think it was December up there on the North Coast, uh, 2015. Right after I, the first season I went up wrangling, I broke my shoulder in a horse wreck in uh, <laughs> the end of August, and then went on a went on a goat hunt just before Christmas. 
we got uh we went in it was like a really short hunt i think it was like the 18th to the 22nd of december uh we went into this <clears throat> went into this drainage we'd seen a couple of goats had bad weather and all that kind of stuff and i mean short days too right you're up there you're up there over the winter solstice uh which was eye-opening and you know learned that that's a terrible time to go hunting goats but uh yeah we got a truck stuck and just kind of had a we didn't know what the hell we were doing i was i was pretty green at that point to uh to mountain hunting and and you know hunting in bc and that kind of stuff so at that point everything was pretty everything kind of felt like a big great big adventure and new you know new train new experiences and um yeah i think that was the first time i'd seen goats uh fly fishing up the squamish river a bunch in the winter like steelheading and stuff there's a couple spots you'll see them there above the river and and seeing them like that but that was the first experience hunting and i wasn't actually hunting myself um i don't even know when the first i guess maybe the first goat hunt i did for myself was that one that that uh, they ended up filming and and that kind of came about like pretty uh pretty sporadically i'd asked connor gabbett a good friend of mine uh to go on a on a winter goat hunt with me i wanted to go and then um it just kind of spiraled from there at the time he was doing a bunch of work with the journal of mountain hunting i was working with the journal of mountain hunting and uh and i guess he pitched that to adam and, and rolled it into a film i came out of the guiding season and found out about it so it was pretty like oh, wow. i didn't know anything about it but you know it's one of those things like especially when you're when you're at any point in your career as a guide but especially like a young guide or a wrangler in that case you know to get the opportunity to spend time on the mountain with people who have so much more experience than you that's always you know that's always exciting and and, and you look at it as a learning opportunity kind of regardless of the outcome so yeah i mean you yeah, look at the sort of uh, my introduction to goats the lineup on that on that film the lineup of characters right i mean you've got mm -hmm. dustin and um what was the other fellow the australian guy dan right dan, um, yeah. yourself Stephen drake i think steven's he certainly if people don't know him yeah. he's a videographer very well known he spends a lot of time on the mountain mm -hmm. and and yourself and uh, of course adam like it looked to me when I, when i watched that film i uh I watched it the, when it first came out and it just blew me away. And I actually put it up this morning when I was having coffee, pulled it up again and watched it. And yeah, I mean, you can, we can dig into that a little bit later as we go around the horn and we'll come back to that, but a uh, pretty interesting story. I mean, um, I'm sure you and Caden both share the, you know, the same issue that guides have is you, you know, obviously you're, you're up in the, in the mountains in the bush, for the most of the hunting season so late season goats becomes sort of a you know one of the few options i guess other than deer hunting for you that late in the year right so yeah yeah for sure and i mean outside of draw tags and stuff right and i mm -hmm. think i mean kate maybe caden can relate to this too but like i feel like guiding you just want uh you want the adventure of it as much as you want like when i go on a hunt for myself i want like I want to have a really good time and I want to, I mean, maybe if I'm deer hunting, it's not going to be an adventure, but if I'm doing a backpack hunt, I want to feel like it's like a really pure adventure. And, and uh, yeah, so you kind of, and that like, you do end up a little bit limited and depending on too, like whether you're, you know, when I was younger, I had a girlfriend now, my wife and family commitments mm -hmm. and stuff like that stuff changes over time. But, but for sure, that's usually the first draw to that because it's otherwise kind of a, a shitty time of year to hunt, but yeah yeah for sure um awesome well we're going to circle back to uh some of the stuff related to that hunt because there's a lot that uh i'm sure the listeners and viewers want to catch up on caden can you uh hop on and maybe tell us a little bit about your uh your first goat hunt? i have a hunch it was with your father but let's let, we'll let you tell the story <laughs> yeah so um first goat hunt went into it um had pneumonia about for the first two weeks before the hunt so that was great. Mom didn't want me to go, but um, I decided I wasn't going to stay home because I've been looking forward to it for years. And um, yeah, went up, felt all right, had some meds and stuff and went in and found goats. Pretty much first day we went in there, we, we didn't see much, but then next day we decided to change zones and we found a couple of goats, which we thought were nannies right off the bat. And then went up to him and we we're looking at him and I got up to about 130 yards and I was looking through the spotter. Dad kind of brushed him off as nannies from about a couple K away. And 
I was looking at him and I have no goat experience. I was 15 years old at that point and went up and looked at him and I was like, that looks like a pretty good Billy dad. And there was two of them there and he looks at him and he's like, Oh yeah, that's, it's a real good Billy <laughs> and ended up being two 10 year olds. Um, so we took the one and then had another buddy up the ridge. He was, I guess he was glass in another spot or something. And I shot the one and he dropped off a cliff and then about five minutes later, a buddy came down and the other one was still standing there looking around and we ended up taking two 10 year old billies that probably had spent most of their life together. So it was a pretty cool hunt. They both died within 50 feet of, of each other. And yeah, so. So then at and, that point you uh, decided to start, you know, tutoring your dad on sex and goats and try to teach him. Yeah, that, Is that the idea? Yeah, I just, I I, from the angle when we first saw him, it was a straight on angle. And I've had it before where you look at them straight on and sometimes you can, their, their horn just looks real skinny from, you know, we didn't have a great spotting scope at that point either. And yeah, he just thought they were nannies, but we decided to hike the ridge anyway and got up to him and I was at 130 and I just pointed him out again. I was like, that doesn't look like a nanny to me. And yeah, so I ended up <laughs> no, being, I guess not. yeah, two real good goats. So, and good good weather so i don't know if you want me to interject on something here but yeah oh absolutely would think that caden would have goat hunted at eight years old like ed because i've been 30 years of this pretty much and caden kind of i used to train with caden he used to be in my pack when i was in paris so that caden's been kind of part of the goat hunting realm all my buddy, buddies would come from pg stay at our house so caden was kind of used to like goat hunting and kind of sheep hunting that's all we kind of did but I actually mm -hmm. didn't take him until he was 15, which was actually by plan. Um, we moved away from Terrace. If we were up there, we probably he probably would have done it a bit younger. But when I moved away, um, I still went back every year for big trips. But I just heard too many stories of bad experiences with young hunters because where we hunt on the coast, it's nasty. So, and I kind of when we go up there, it's generally a 10 day hunt. So. I kind of want to continue to do long hunts and introduce Caden on a 10 day hunt. Cause that's a full, like, there's a lot of romance in 10 days. There's a lot of good stuff that happens. So I kind of wanted that full experience and I wanted good weather. And um, we had everything like we had almost the full time was beautiful weather. Uh, and he was old enough mentally and physically to be able to take it because it's a tough go. And if you're in for 10 days, we went deep. It's a totally new spot. First time in there. And I just felt it was I wanted to wait till he is tough enough uh, mentally and physically, and he and he definitely was. He still was aching because he didn't have good gear that at that time, which was probably a, by design also, because uh, most of us started off with pretty shitty gear. So I didn't want him to have the best gear. So <laughs> so his pack was killing him. What else? Your boots? Oh, I think boots were good, but Boot, yeah, mostly pack, the pack. The pack was cheap, killing Cheap him. packs and weight and it doesn't go together. You know, well. those cheap mech packs, that's how I started with a cheap mech pack, 200 bucks, but it killed me too. So kind of part of it is, you know, that was good too, right? To have a lot of things were good, but to have some crappy gear because now he appreciates the good stuff. So it's yeah, and then I didn't have good rain gear at that point either. That was a, we did have pretty good weather, but oh. he did get the odd day in there. That's we started off with crappy weather yeah that's right it was all soft so what time of year which which month were you guys on end of august first trip? end of august okay. so. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah interesting yeah. well it's quite an experience i know um you know blake and i have kind of um we've been on the mountain hunting journey together i've you know i've hunted my entire life and um we were pretty much deer hunters and moose hunters up until about seven eight years ago and then we discovered that but I didn't have, uh, I think if, if Blake was to, to pipe on here, probably tell you that he trained with me because he just stuffs my fat ass in his pack and hauls me around up there because <laughs> it's awfully hard to, it's awfully hard to keep up with uh, these young guys, but uh, you got to work a little harder. So Marvin, why don't you tell us about your uh, first goat experience? Uh, yeah, I got to, I got to go deep with this because it's been a few years. Um, so mid nineties, uh, we wanted to hunt goats my whole life. Like it was mountain hunting is kind of how I came out. I was like, I, I want to chase those animals. Uh, I was reading a Jack O'Connor book, uh, big game animals in North America. I have it beside me. I have the original my parents had. So I was cracking that book open since I was, you know, old enough to look at books. 
and wanted to wanted to mountain hunt. Uh, my dad didn't hunt. Um, my uncles hunted. One's a taxidermist, so I got to go to his place and look at him doing up sheep and goats, and thought that's what I want to do when I grow up. So it's always on my mind. I didn't have the chance to really start hitting the mountains till I basically finished my schooling and stuff like that. So. I actually started at 28 years old, so that's a bit of a late bloomer um, compared to some people in this. On this, <laughs> so I started off uh, when I first moved back to Terrace for the second time, and really didn't have any buddies buddies to hunt with. I had one buddy actually; he hunted, but he never goat hunted. Uh, I heard about goat hunting a lot through my boss when I first moved to Terrace. I, I lived there twice. Uh, my boss is pretty avid goat hunter so i kind of he's been kind of my mentor sort of in the office when i worked with him for many years um so he kind of got me pretty riled up about chasing goats so i kind of grabbed whoever i could find to goat hunt like i take not i took guys that work with me or for me uh guys that didn't hunt so that first experience was with one of my my good buddies. We kind of learned goat hunting together. Uh, we just went out for a day trip, late September, uh, very uh, wet snow, and it was a gong show. Like I didn't have good gear. Um, I think I had an external pack, was getting caught up always in the slide alder. Uh, I remember wiping out, I had glasses all fogged up, couldn't find my glasses, didn't have hiking, trekking poles, because trekking poles back then were for Europeans and for a weekend, you know, they were for granolas. So <laughs> we, you just didn't go, you just didn't, didn't use a hiking pole. You just, you just don't do that. Um, uh, got up on the mountain. It was right socked in. Uh, we didn't see any goats. We saw a goat, fresh goat track. I remember being so physically exhausted, ran out of water, uh, didn't use a water filter still don't really use a water filter we can get into that later um i'm starting to now because i don't want something like that to screw me uh, and i thought i probably have pushed my luck long enough without a filter so it's probably going to happen now these days but then there was no water there was this tiny little crack like we were on a knife ridge there was this little uh, wedge of water and it had bugs in it and everything. And I just remember sipping out of that thing. Like I was so freaking thirsty and that was it. Like we didn't, it was one day thing. Uh, but like a lot of trips, it left me wanting more. I just wanted to be out there. Um, about a month later, I actually got my first goat. Um, didn't take really, wasn't much of a hunter. He's actually was a work, a work mate. He's my current boss actually right now, but he's only done one goat hunt that I remember. And it was that one with me. I uh, went up a valley November 3rd, I think it was, and saw some goats. I didn't really know much about nannies and billies or didn't know much about goats to tell you the truth, um, as far as uh, aging or, or sexing them. It was kind of like the first legal goats going down. Um, I remember we cro I crossed the creek. I did three stalks on that goat, November stripping down, going through the creek, freezing. Just it was it was nasty, wet snow, and going across those creeks, you know, taking your boots off. Uh, so the third time up, I nailed that goat. It was like three thirty, so just before dark, um, and it turned out to be a one and a half year old Billy. I still have the uh, the, the the hide. I was proud as punch and I'm still proud as punch on that one. So your first of anything is just phenomenal. And all my first animals have been pretty small. My first ram was a 10 year old, but he was small. Um, same with Grizzly, my first Grizz was small as well. So, you know, and, and that's something of interest because as much as I now I'm pretty fussy, I'm mature and big. Um, I think there's something to be said about you know some early success i'm not from a hunting background um just and you work off of that and you learn and you grow um you know i wish i could have taken a 10 year old billy the first time but <laughs> it just didn't work out that way but again it was it was a small little one and a half year old he was legal i took him um and i pretty much hunted for 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 food that's that's what i did that was my first big game animal and i love goat meat so that's kind of the start of it 
No, right on. And, you know, you make a good point. Um, you know, your first legal harvest on any species as a new hunter um, is the one that sticks with you the most. It's the one you, hopefully it's the memory you cherish the most about hunting. And um, it's, you know, it's something to build on. And uh, hunting's hard and goat hunting especially is hard. So, yeah, congratulations for sure on that one. Um, well, I know some of our listeners have heard this next story from ed but uh, why don't you give us a quick overview on your first goat hunt because it's a it's a pretty cool story thanks ed yeah a lot a lot like marvin um my goat was two and a half years old you know he was just kick, kicked out of the herd there and just barely legal that fall but it makes no never mind to me that's the biggest trophy in my whole career as far as i'm concerned um all started I would have been eight years old, uh, 1999 in late September. And so dad had an LEH for region six, four, um, which there isn't really much LEH there anymore. And back in the nineties, it was, that's where we spent most of our time was over in that area. So we knew it pretty well. So dad had an old friend from the area that uh, he's an old farmer that lived out in the bush with no power, no running water, you know, just kind of as redneck as they come. And he had a son the same age as me. And so we made the plan that we were going to go and hike up the mountain and see if we could find a goat. So we packed up from what I remember for four days, um, me and the other kid didn't have packs, but our dads did. And we got up there and I think it was day two getting near the end of the day. Uh, we were on top of the mountain and they glassed across a big basin and there was a few goats over there. And I can distinctly remember dad's partner. Like dad, dad says, you know, if, if we go over there and get a goat, we're not going to be coming back to camp tonight. And the other guy, John, his name was, says, you know, well, builds character. It's not going to kill us. Let's go for it. So away we went. And uh, I actually had a... a custom rifle built my granddad being a uh, gunsmith stock maker he had built me a 65 by 55 ackley improved um for this hunt and scopes were pretty new to us we always hunted with iron sights when i was young and so this rifle had this new scope on it which was a tasco wide angle three by nine and I, I remember that distinctly too it was silver it looked like hell on my rifle but uh I use that. So we went after these goats and we got up to the edge of the ridge and I was belly crawling over with my dad and uh, we goats were in front of us about a hundred yards away and one stood out as just bigger than all the rest. And so dad's trying to line me up on the right goat and I'm just about ready to squeeze the trigger. And somehow he could tell what goat I was pointing at and he gave me a wait, 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 and had to explain again. And it's a good thing he did because I was going to shoot the wrong goat. But got me lined up on the billy anyway, and uh, I was shooting those 160 grain Hornaday round nose out of it. And uh, the first shot went square through through the shoulders, and it, the goat didn't even flinch. You, you couldn't have told, told I hit it. So I hit him again, and he fell down into this nasty creek bottom. And I remember Dad kind of, shaking his head like crap now what are we gonna do right so we always it was always the thing if you shot your animal you took your scope off your rifle for two reasons in case you fall and you break your scope or if you have bear issues you have iron sights versus a scope on your rifle so i had the scope off my gun and dad and john were going to go down to this creek and and butcher up the goat so i got to watch through the scope you know because i had it off my rifle and it was pretty neat. Me and Jason, the other kid, kind of bounced back and forth. And so they got the goat out and got back up to us. And we're on the wrong side of the mountain from camp. And so we found a little shintangle bush because uh, it was just getting dark and it was just starting to rain and sleet and snow. And we had no, no blankets, no sleeping bag, no tent, no spare clothes, no anything. Um, so we huddled up under a balsam tree and just kept a fire going all night cooking goat on a stick and you could hear the wolves howling down in the trees below us because i think the runoff of the of them butchering up the goat was flowing down the creek down and you could hear all the wolves howling it was pretty it was pretty cool throughout the night you know and um the next morning we woke up and there was a skiff of snow around everywhere and uh we managed to make our way out and that was 
that hunt, I, I swore I would never eat goat again because I think for whatever reason, I, we were eating a piece of the calf muscle or something, but you couldn't chew it. You pretty much had to suck on it and stick it in the side of your cheek, and that's about all you could do with it. But uh, no, it was good though. It's it's a time, it's a memory that I'll never forget, and uh, I, I learned a lot, you know, just about myself, about what what you're capable of, right? Um, but I had a pretty good mentor in that sense. He, uh, I was pretty well looked after for the most part. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, well, that's a good segue into something that we we want to kind of touch on tonight. Um, now, I know Ed, you personally, I know that you're uh, you're a big fan of mentorship, and you give a lot back to the uh, to the hunting community and to new hunters. And um, for example, you know, you took a buddy of ours on a, a winter goat hunt a couple of years back. Uh, a bunch of guys went in there, um, new to it. Um, you actually discovered a, a, sh a sheep hunting partner out of that as well. Um, sure did. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it's really, it, it's really cool that there's, um, you know, the, the mentorship exists in the hunting community and we need to nurture that. And I want to kind of flip it back yeah. over to Caden for a minute. Um, you know, having, you know, your dad, um, you know, such a, a accomplished mountain hunter and obsessive goat hunter, uh, can you tell us a little bit what it was like kind of following following your dad around on the mountain and maybe, you know, a couple of things that you picked up um, that stick with you as far as um, takeaways from, from your dad as a mentor in the hunting space? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it kind of, it almost feels like cheating when your dad's that good at goat hunting. I mean, he brings you to a spot that he's never been to. You go in there and you see goats the second day and not just any goat, you know, two 10 year old billies. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, to have, have him all my life, you know, just talk about goats and seeing goats come home and all that stuff. And I think one thing I've taken away is just even when I'm with other people is just having patience and stuff is when I was younger, you know, I, I've been set up on a lot of animals and I haven't been able to get shots off or whatever. And I find even when I'm guiding or whatever, sometimes they get pretty riled up or I try to stay calm, but it kind of gets to you sometimes when, you know, you feel like you could get set up, but they can't or something like that. And I feel like just him having patience was with me was just a real helpful thing. And obviously he gets riled up, you know, if you've seen any <laughs> videos or anything of me, he's always yelling at me in the background, but it's not in a way of, mean it's just in a way of excitement so i think yeah. just no i hear you yeah the patience has been has been really good and um a lot of people well, i think have a hard time you know with identifying goats and stuff at the start and for me it was like i've just seen them come home so many times that i just i generally knew what i was looking at when i got out there which was nice so yeah you, right on well you, sorry go ahead mark the the patience and Caden was was pretty good at that too. Like on the second goat hunt, he got a goat as well. We actually went back to the same area. And I mentioned that the other night, I think. We just we just sat in the tent yeah. with the spotter on the goat. Because I said, that goat is not going to end up if if we shoot the goat there, he's going to end up in the in the bowl and there's no access into the bowl. So I mean, Katie, you can say some more about yeah. that one. Yeah, there's a lot of um things like I know when I first time when I've been pe with people who haven't been goat hunting before, they look at a goat and they think, Oh, I'm just going to shoot it right there. Right. But there's a lot more thinking that comes into it than, you know, shooting a deer or whatever that's running by you, you know, a, ro a goat can run by you at 50 yards, but he can be on the other side of a ravine or a crevice that you can't ever get to. Right. So he taught me a lot about that. And when I first started, I'd look at a goat and I'd want to shoot it right away. And he just kind of calming down and looking at the situation first and how we're going to retrieve it and kind of the whole thing um has been a really important part of it too because uh we've been in some sketchy situations even after looking at where we're going to shoot them and yeah i think we'll get into that later yeah. the near death stories if you're going to ask us about <laughs> any near death <laughs> he's got a story to tell <laughs> okay uh well yeah just on the patience thing i guess you know just listening to you and this thought came to mind um, you know, there's, I guess there's two types of, um, patients with a, with a hunter who's also a guide. I mean, you've got to, 
you got that natural um, patience built in from years of hunting with your dad. Uh, yeah. Everybody, if you've hunted, then you ex you've experienced buck fever or goat fever, sheep fever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're eight years old or 55, it still happens. And then um, I always tell people, if you say you're, if you say you've never had buck fever, you're, you're lying or you've never had an animal in front of you because it does happen. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I've, I've done a couple of guided hunts um, over the years too. And um, you know, I think that managing patience as a guide has to be super challenging, right? Like you've got, somebody who's paid, they paid a lot of money to come on this hunt. Um, like you said, um, early on there, Caden, you, you know, you felt that sometimes maybe I could get behind the rifle quicker and be on this animal fast and ready to go. And your, your client has to, you know, get adjusted and stuff. I'm going to flip the Nolan for a second and just, you know, see if he's got any insight on that and how you guys handle, how do you handle the client, you know, with a once in a lifetime situation like that and maybe some pressure added with the animal getting ready to go or leave or whatever. Yeah, I think that's a tough, like you just, it's like anything with hunting, right? The more reps you get through it, the, the more natural it becomes. Um, I think by nature, I'm a pretty patient person. Um, so that element is, is, is not maybe as much of a struggle for me, but, um, but it's also kind of the, you know, there, I guess there's two things. One as a guide, like you can't pull the trigger, you can't aim a rifle, you can't pull a trigger, but there's all of this, like, as you know, Caden knows, there's all of this other stuff that goes into it. Right. Cause it's not mm -hmm. generally speaking, like I'd say probably 98% of the time, it's not like if I was hunting with Marvin or Ed or one of my regular hunting partners where I just take care of me and we bounce ideas off each other. Like there's a variation of, you know, you get your like Kansas whitetail hunter that is literally at ground zero. And then you get some guys in the Western States that are, they do some DIY hunts. They're not used to being like, you know, 14 days or in that amount of wilderness, but they're still pretty competent with a lot of their own decision-making in the back country. So you, it kind of varies there. But, um, as, as far as that goes, like I look at it two ways. One, my job is to get you, get you in front of an animal you know, like a, what are you age class animal or trophy quality or, but get you in front of a representative animal in a distance that's, um, you know, reasonable shooting. Like we usually try for under 350 yards. I don't know what you guys do in the outfits you've worked at Caden, but it's probably similar. Yeah. It, depending on the hunter, but uh, yeah, usually even if yeah, they say yeah. far, usually closer, the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're yeah. kind of trying to do that, but but there's also an element for me that like, Hey, once I've, you know, if I'm, whether I'm moose hunting or stone sheep hunting, once I've got a guy there in a reasonable setup, like not like we bust something and it runs off at that point, I've kind of, I look at it as like, I've fulfilled my end of the contract. So the pressure is off the guide at that point. And at the, for me, I'm like, I look at it now. My job is to just keep you as calm as possible. So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's been times where like internally I've been crapping my pants being like, we just busted our ass or like one, you know, one time I backpacked for, I think it was like 16 days. I sat on the same band of Rams and some cliffs. Second client came in, couldn't, couldn't kill them. They just wouldn't come into a killable area. Finally they did. We get set up and the guy's like, you know, he's, he's visibly panicked. And I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm like, man, if we miss this opportunity, like I've just, this has been more than two weeks. Like I'm spent. This is a lot, yeah, no it's a doubt. lot of patience. No and, uh, yeah, but at that point, you're like, you know, also that all my job is at this point is to keep you calm. So, like, I'm going to lie to you and tell you we have all the time in the world. I remember telling this guy, don't worry about it. All the time in the world, take your time, dry fire. They don't know we're here. Mentally, I'm like just freaking out. Totally, shoot, but you, shoot. You, know, <laughs> you don't want to, you see, the inside of your wall tent sets on fire. You don't add gasoline to it, right? So, so yeah, I think exactly. it's it's a process that you that just comes comes with time and some people are better at it. I've heard stories of fantastic guides that have like, you know, they'll spin out and that's just a part of who they are. They get super jacked and excited. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think patience, I mean, that's a that's a it, it's it's a difficult thing to manage, but it's probably the most important thing, especially in hunting, right? I mean, patience at all mm -hmm. levels, right? From you know, from aging a sheep to, um, you know, determining sex of a goat, uh, just all around. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
That's a good, that's a good point there, Caden. Thank you very much. Ed, what about you? What's uh, your biggest takeaway from your, your mentor or mentors? Um, biggest one has always probably been the safety aspect, you know, um, it's been pounded into me pretty clear that if, if you got to think two or three times about where you're going, chances are it's probably not worth it, right? If, if you're scaring yourself going up, then coming down is going to be twice as, twice as hard. Um, another has always been fire. You know, if, if, if no, no matter where you're at, always try and keep in mind somewhere that you've seen a, you know, a, dry, a dry snag or some firewood or something. Um, yeah, sometimes when all your gear gets wet and you're soaked to the bone and the last thing you have left is a little lighter in your pocket, you know, it's it's good to remember certain places where you know you can get to and get some fire going. Um, yeah, those are the two biggest ones that, that I can remember was just always the safety, make sure you come home at the end of the hunt, right? Um, another one was water. Uh, he pounded into me a little bit, but I learned as I got older, um, there was a couple of times where we ran out of water and got dehydrated and you start getting the cramps and uh, you're still a whole day away from from the closest creek, right? It gets pretty scary when, when your body starts giving out when the whole time you're thinking to yourself you're invincible. Um, dehydration will, will prove you wrong really fast. Uh, so that's another thing that I like, no matter what hunt I go on, my whole trip planning is usually based around water, water supplies. If, if I don't know if there's water, you know, I'll pack as much as I got to. Some, it sucks packing 20 pounds of water, but it's better than, than running out. Uh, um, yeah, very good point. Um, yeah, and there's nothing, there's nothing worse than, um, you know, thinking you're going to have water when you get to a spot and then you hike up there and the creek's dry. Now you got to start yeah. again or drop 2000 feet and try and find it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, sure. now, and Ed, your dad, um, you still hunt with your father, right? And he's what, 70 in his early seventies, I think. Right. Yeah. He'll be going into 73 here next, uh, in February. Um, oh, right on. And yeah, he's still, he's still giving her, you know, he's slowing down on his work and he was, he was a work animal up until last year. He, he'd work seven days a week if he could. Um, yeah. You know, he, he is limited. His balance isn't what it used to be and, and whatnot. So he's got to take his time and pick his roots carefully and stuff. But uh, he gets out there and gives it his best. And uh, we were out last October, November, it would have been for his go tell H. And uh, he, he was gung-ho to go. And we, we made a day stock on a, a bunch of nannies that we thought might be billies. And uh, we had a blast, you know, uh, we, we busted our butts going up and got soaking wet and sore and, but it was, uh, you know, you, it was successful on every count except for pulling a trigger really. And that's the biggest thing it, for, for my dad and I, it don't matter if we pull a trigger, you know, it, sure. It's great if you find the goat you're looking for, but if you can get out and you can look at some and take some pictures and just watch and see what goats do, it, it makes the whole trip worth it um but yeah we're, we're kind of a lot like marv you know you're, you're on a look for a particular goat um you know but dad and i each got some a couple of big goats so i kind of we're, we're holding out for something that class or bigger you know which they're not easy to come by um so you, you got to put in some time to to find them mm -hmm. yeah for sure um one of the questions um, that I wanted to ask uh, all of you guys kind of around the horn a little bit, um, you know, clearly there's two sort of, you know, real main mountain animals that people hunt in the West, one being sheep, obviously, and the other being goats. Um, what would you say? I'm going to flip it over to Marvin and Caden. Maybe you guys could tag team this. You guys have both hunted. I see a sheep in the background. I know you're both sheep hunters and goat hunters. What would you say the the biggest difference is between a, a goat hunt and a sheep hunt as far as the animals, their behavior? Obviously, we know the terrain is similar. Sometimes, you know, it's a little different with goats. But I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. Maybe you could chime in over there. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll start it off. Actually, for interest's sake, I did take Caden on mountain hunts when he was young. Go, I took him on sheep hunt, a couple of sheep hunts. 
but they weren't big trips for thin horns. They were more of the local trips here for the big horns. So, um, yeah. So for interest, I did take them on a few like three day hunts, uh, but they were pretty tough on them too at an eight or nine years old. So, um, that's where I decided I'm going to lay off a bit. Uh, cause I kind of have one, I kind of hunt one way and it's generally a bit harder. So, <laughs> so that's why I waited. Um, but going into, uh, the, yeah, I've done quite a few sheep hunts. Um, as far as say thin horns, I've probably done, I think it's 13, um, hunts for, for, for stones. Um, there's quite a difference. One is the pressure. Um, it's kind of why I lean towards goat hunting more is I rarely ever see anybody. Like it feels like I have the mountain to myself. We had the mountain to ourselves on our last stone hunt last year, but guess what? We didn't see a single ram. So that could happen too. If, if generally the saying is if, if there's lots of, if there's rams, there's going to be guys, other guys as well, or other hunters. So one of the things with goats is I just simply like, it's, it's the mountains ours. Um, the other is the, the terrain I find, and I've been in some pretty tough sheep terrain, but I find the, the hunt is just a level up as far as the gnarliness, um, of the terrain. Um, most, I can't think of a sh difficult retrieval on a ram. Um, I think I've been on about a dozen retrievals and they weren't that scary from what I recall. I don't remember any being scary actually. Uh, I could think of most of my goat hunts being uh, very challenging on the retrievals. Like there's the odd one that's going to be dropping on the flats or in an easy spot, but it's, so that's quite a difference as well. Um, I've turned my goat hunts kind of into sheep hunts and I won't go for a goat hunt usually really less than 10 days. So I like that component. It's like I've turned it into a long hunt. I used to hunt one, two days for years, right? And I do... 10, 20, one day hunts or two day hunts. Um, so yeah, now I make it into like, it feels like it's a sheep hunt. It's a full on going deep for the most part, um, but I'm not running into anybody. So that's kind of neat. The one spot we've been going, you know, where I took Hayden the first two times, the only set of tracks, cause we have to climb over a bit of a, um, a saddle into a, into a certain area we saw our tracks from the year before. That's the only set of tracks we see other than animal tracks is our tracks. So it's kind of cool to go into areas that are simply not really hunted. That's a little bit tougher on a sheep hunt, I would say. Um, I would agree. Areas where there is nobody, um, you know, you're going to see guides, you're going to see resident hunters and the number of sheep hunters seems to be going up. Um, I'd say the goat hunter numbers are also going up. Um, but I don't think, I think you can still get into a lot of country that is not really hunted at all, uh, which is pretty cool. Other than that, uh, the gear in my view is the same. I bring the same gear pretty much on both hunts. It's the same thing. So uh, mm -hmm. it's more the, it's more just the trains different and uh, the animal itself. Uh, as far as the stalking goes, <clears throat> I can get pretty close to sheep I have as well. So. And my average goat is 90 yards. My average sheep is 142, I think. So I'm a bit of a numbers guy. So not that much difference as far as the shot. So generally similar, I like to get close to the animals. And I've been up close with 20 yards. I've been up my closest ram, I think it's 55. Another one at 70. So some close sheep. Uh, and I've taken a few goats at like 20 yards. So mm. that's kind of that. Yeah, I think that covers it for me too, pretty much. I don't think I have much to add to that. So, um, yeah, over. I'm going to shoot this one over to Nolan. So, um, when you guys are preparing for um, a goat hunt and or a sheep hunt, um, is there a difference in preparation from the guide's perspective when you know your hunter's coming in? Like, I'm assuming you get uh, guys coming in for combo hunts and then maybe some like species specific hunts, they want to kill a goat. You guys do anything different on the guiding side in advance of that, or is it all kind of cut and dried? Yeah, not really. I mean, I think every, uh, every time you hunt different country or different camps, you might, you know, prepare yourself a little bit differently or like, 
if you're moving, say your client flies into one area, whether it's a lake or a strip, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then you're moving from that with the horses to a different area and you're going to spike out from there. I think it varies more area to area than it does species to species between uh, sheep and goats. Like Marvin said, it's similar. Like you're talking about similar shot distances. Generally goat terrain is going to be hairier. Retrievals are going to be hairier. Like I've never had to tie a sheep to something and I've <laughs> tied multiple goats to like a little strip of willow or whatever, a boulder, anything you can find. Like I always, you know, I'm sure most of the time I probably, sure there's lots of times i don't even have paracord or my pack sheep hunting but that would be if i knew i was guiding a goat hunt it's like all right you gotta have at least nope. you know 35 feet of paracord as a bare minimum if not depending on season area etc you know those late hunts we'd carry 30 meters or 31 meters of i can i don't remember what it was like nine mil rope or some kind of a climbing rope mm -hmm. Uh, just as a precaution but yeah so a, a not really different in preparation for the most part um mm -hmm. and then lots of my goat hunts guiding a lot of them are combo hunts with moose um so that would be like a you know horseback you have areas you know the goats are um i i have historically guided mostly pretty low density sheep uh within our area so uh, that's different for me like sheep hunts are a lot more pressure i don't know if if, if you would say the same for guiding caden but um i've yeah as far as my own personal hunting experience, I don't have as much there. It's mostly been guiding, but, but yeah, sheep hunts, you just have the pressure because, because it's, you know, whatever it is, I don't know, six, seven times the cost of a goat hunt. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, and sheep, imagine. like you don't, if you're, if you're in low density areas, like I had, I did, I guided two hunts this year and didn't, didn't get a ram. Um, mm -hmm. So it, no, that's a possibility. Whereas goats, you're basically like, if my client is like somewhat physically capable, and can shoot 300 yards like there's you know and we don't get screwed by weather we're gonna kill a goat like you have enough areas mm -hmm. and you've got horses and where i am you're never gonna see like i've never seen anyone goat hunting in seven years i've never seen mm -hmm. or i guess eight years i've never seen someone in there goat hunting like there'd be the odd sheep hunter who kills a nice billy they bump into but nobody's gonna go spend their time to go all the way in there when there's so many better places in the province as far as genetics and stuff for resident mm -hmm. hunters so I, it, it's a little bit, yeah, it's a bit different for me, but they're, I, I quite enjoy goat hunting. Goat hunting is for me, like the, when the late season flips over and I get goat clients, it's almost like a wash of relief. I mean, I love, I love sheep hunting. I like guiding sheep. I think as a sheep guide, it's the most rewarding species to guide because of how hard it can be. Uh, mm -hmm. but like moose is the most enjoyable for me and goats is probably right up there with moose as, as far as just pure hunting. It's a lot more laid back. I find. So, Harder yeah. So laid back. laid back. Um, what, what's the real like sense of relief for you when you know it's goat time? Like, what do you like the most about it? Obviously, like you said, the pressure of sheep hunting, I can only imagine you got somebody that's yeah. paid 80 grand or hundred grand us. I mean, that's gotta be a load of pressure on the guide. And then in a lot of cases that goat hunt is an accessory hunt, you know, like a guy comes in for 70, 65 inch moose and then, Oh, I got a goat tag. Right. I mean, what for you, like, what's that real tipping point where like, Oh, this is what I love about it. I mean, for one, they're easier to see. Like uh, there's been times where I've sat, I, want, I remember one time I was sitting up on top of the mountain looking for sheep, looked across a big Valley and a couple drainages up or whatever, saw some white dots in the binos, pulled my spawning scope out. Hey, there's a bunch of nannies and kids, half a dozen of them or something like that. Looked it on my topo, 14 kilometers away. Like you're never gonna spot stone sheep 14 kilometers away. So there's that element of it where it's like, you know, they're just easy to find. You're not gonna be in good goat country and not find the goats generally. As Marvin said before, like there's lots of times where you're gonna find billies in places that you're not gonna kill them. You're going to have to be patient. You wait it out. You might not kill one because a good one, you know, was in a bad spot and then it moved on and you couldn't because of the terrain catch back up to it. That kind of stuff happens, but uh, I don't think I've ever not found any goats. There's been maybe one or two hunts. I haven't found a mature billy, but generally speaking, like it's, you know, from my standpoint with the horse access and being able to cover, like we can go, we can cover 40 kilometers in one day. 
So mm-hmm. it's, it opens up a whole playground for us out there. And if you, once you know your camps and you know the country a bit more, you kind of have your spots and you're like, okay, well, you know, if I go to this spot for three days and I've got a client who can, who can hike a little bit, mm-hmm. um, you know, we, sh- we should be in the money. So that's the, yeah, that, that's kind of how that unfolds. Right on. Um, well, I want to s- use that as a bit of a segue, kind of get into the lessons learned and some some of the stories that you guys might have. Um, you know, the uh, goat hunting in general comes with like, a, as you guys all mentioned, you know, gnarly terrain um, certainly has its safety challenges um, just to access and then not only access, but once you shoot an animal, uh, goats are tough. If you, you know, if you've uh, watched any kind of videos, or if you've been on a goat hunt, and you've s- seen them absorb lead. They're tough animals, and they tend to jump when they die. So, let's uh, let's get into some stories and talk about um, you know some of the exciting stuff, whether it's sketchy retrievals or um, dangerous situations. I don't know, Ed. You want to? You got? You're nodding your head. You got something? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, there's there's been a few. Um, I'll start with the first one, which was my next goat after my first one when I was a kid there. Um, I had a local guy that I grew up with lots. And uh, as a teenager, he started coming with my dad and I doing some goat hunting. And so him and I set off on our first goat hunt with the two of us. And uh, so we seen that we were hunting off a lake from a boat and the goats were on top of the mountain. So we thought we would be up there in two or three hours being a couple of young guys. And so we headed up off the lake and about eight or nine hours later, we got to the top of the mountain where the goats were. And without enough daylight to get back to the lake, we thought we would go back, go over the backside of the mountain, camp down there for the night and make the trek back to the lake the next day. So the next morning, we looked up the mountain and there's these goats. So we left camp down there. We hiked up the mountain and just peeked over the top and there's this lone goat sitting there so i'm looking down at the lake that we that we hiked up from there's a lone goat sitting there and i shoot it and it's she's only maybe 20 30 feet in front of us and we thought it was a billy uh turned out to be a lone nanny old lone nanny which was the whole start of my wanting to learn mountain goats that, that's where it all began um because when i shot her I took her spine right right out of her shoulders. Um, you could see a clear hole in the top of her shoulders. And her head fell down. And, of course, we thought it was game over. And it wasn't five seconds go by. And she stretched out her front legs stiff like this. And then over the edge she went down this cliff. Um, that was a classic case of not looking where your retrieval's going to be. And... Uh, you know, it, we, there's no way we would leave a goat on a mountain. And so we scared the crap out of ourselves a few times getting after this goat. And every time she would stop, it would be in a spot where you couldn't work on her. So you'd have to push her over the next cliff, you know. And it ended up being five, six, seven hundred yards down the mountain by the time we got to a spot where we could actually work on her. Uh, so we got her in our bags. And... Us being young, figuring the easiest way back to the lake is following the creek, which is pretty much 100% of the time the wrong way to go. So we dropped down to this creek bottom and uh, big cliffs on each side of the creek. Now we're getting down into the timber, kind of where it transitions. These creeks go from cliff down into timber and we got into some big waterfalls. And ended up, we had to go back up the mountain about a half a kilometer to get back onto a treed ridge that we could come down. Um, this is a huge learning lesson. You know, if, if you're coming down a mountain, stay out of the creek bottom, stay on a ridge, uh, because the chances are if you go in a creek bottom, you're going to be coming right back out of it the same way that you went into it. Um, classic case of don't pull the trigger if you can't see what's under that goat. That's a, it's a, that's a bad thing about hunting goats from the top, even though it's, it's generally the best way to go to stalk a goat. Unless you know what's under the goat, it, it's, it can be hit and miss. Um, so do your homework, whether it's through mapping or visually inspecting the area first, you know. Um, 
another one, uh, just your typical going up. Uh, this was another hunt with the same guy. We, uh, we, we doubled up on two big billies late in the day. Um, gung ho to go, not a, didn't have any close, spare clothes, no camp, no food, no nothing. Figured, oh, we'll be back by the end of the day. We're young and tough, right? Turned out we pulled the triggers about an hour before dark and we're two lakes away from camp. <laughs> you know, we had to canoe across one lake, then it was two kilometers through the bush to the next lake where our boat was. Um, and we got stuck going up that mountain uh, into a spot. I had a, I had a brand new Tika 300 Magnum. That's kind of when the Tikas first came into fad. First trip of this with this rifle. And I ended up having to build stairs in the side of this mountain bank with the butt of my rifle so that we could get out of there because there was no way we were going back down where we came up. Um, there was actually for a while there, we thought we were going to have to get helicoptered out because we were, we were hugging cliffs and there was nowhere you could go. Um, just another big learning lesson. You know, if, if you're double questioned, if you're thinking about going up, scaring yourself, then best, figure out your exit plan sooner than later because uh it doesn't get any easier <laughs> and you know ropes don't really do much good when you're up in the rocks either like if there's no no limbs to tie onto or tree branches um sometimes you get a little jagged rock you might be able to get a little hoot and lasso around them but um it's just not worth it you know if if you get into a predicament like that yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think Marvin touched on it the other night. We were talking about ropes, and he said, if you don't know how, don't know what you're doing with a rope, don't bring it, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, don't rely on a rope, whatever you do. That's that's last resort, you know. And generally, it's for lowering your pack or tying your animal while, you, while you're while you butchering it. It, it. I don't pack a rope to lower myself, you know. It's, yeah, uh, no, that requires some training for sure. Um yeah. You know, that just reminded me of something, Nolan, when I uh, was watching the Toe on the Line film, um, you guys, in that in that show, you guys make a very significant uh, trek up the mountain. I think it was a couple days worth of pack, and then you got to a point where you couldn't go any further. Maybe tell us a little bit about that, because, you know, I, you made a comment on there, and I, again, it's fresh because I watched it, but yeah, I think there was a comment to the effect that it was about as close as you could get to dying. So I'm curious what what that experience was like or, or putting yourself, I guess, in a situation where you could die, I guess is more like what you said. Yeah. Um, to, I will say to this day, that is the worst. That's the worst hillside I've ever been on. And Marvin knows where that is. Uh, it is like, I'm sure there's hammers in there. I know we saw book goats in there. I've never had the desire to go back. That was 2018. I, every once in a while it like blips through your mind and you're like yeah i wonder if i should go in there and it, it's just not i don't know like ed like ed said earlier right i mean the end goal is always to come back and and it's never worth it to get yourself i mean i've been hurt in the mountains i know what it's like to come out of there you know and what that's what that's like the recovery and everything like that and thankfully for me it was like pretty minor as far as things go but um yeah it's just it's one of those things that now lots of places that like, if I just look at it and it looks really bad, you know, enough to be like, it's not worth it. Like no animals worth putting myself in a situation where I'm going to die or I'm at risk of dying or, you know, God forbid you like search and rescue whoever has to come in and, and risk their lives to recover you for doesn't matter how big the goat is like, or any animal for that matter. It's not worth it. But, um, yeah in that case we tried to get up on top of a mountain and uh we'd never been in there before we had a big snowstorm beforehand like i think that was one of the slowest uh slowest hike ins i've ever had and we pulled in a whole bunch of gear for kind of a base camp um situation and yeah just got into a situation where we were looking at you know we were probably only 300 meters vertical from the alpine and breaking into where we could you know access the goats but uh it was super steep there was no we couldn't continue to go up the way we were going and to continue up a more gradual slope we would have had to cross an ice waterfall that was like uh, it was probably like 60 degrees 65 degrees but it felt like it was like 80. you know and we had crampons and ice axes and a couple of the guys were like hey we can shimmy across this and then sling our packs across and, and that was the point where i was like hey like 
we're not, you know, we're just out here having fun like anyone else. Like, yeah, this is exactly. stupid. Let's find there's different goat. There's other goats or there's no goats. It doesn't matter. I'm not willing to risk that. So yeah, that was the steepest. And that was, you know, it was a puckering experience. I've spent a lot more time in the backcountry now and, and spent a lot of time in steep situations, but steep situations and snow is different for me. Like I'm pretty comfortable on knife ridges, you know, right on top of a mountain with big drops on either side. If it's two feet wide, that's okay. Um, but snow, you know, no, I, it's one of those things. Like I took some avalanche safety courses and it's like, I know just enough to know that I don't know anything. And, and the instability of that, like snow and, and that factor of it, it's just for me, I'm like, yeah, that was it. So that was probably the worst. I think that's the worst situation I've been in as far as, as goat hunting and stuff like that. And we pulled out of there and, and a couple of the guys, um, Dustin and, and Stephen Drake and Connor Gabbett actually went in there the next year and they arrowed two goats. Wow. So they were successful and and you know kudos to dustin he is the most driven hunter i've ever hunted with like i don't i think that guy takes no is like a personal offense to him when it comes to hunting so yeah that's he what i've heard drive and, and went back but but yeah it was it was as skookum as it gets for me like i don't need to i've had a few a few uh kind of nasty retrievals but i don't think any of them were quite as bad as that spot and that was now you yeah exactly have you ever gotten in a situation with a, a client where you get them into a spot everything's going well and then all of a sudden the client gets terrified scared nervous panic sets in i'm sure you have you're nodding your head what's that like how do yeah, you handle that for sure for sure i mean there's varying degrees i can think of one uh i had a tent like i was using an old outfitter tent and the tent fly ripped open we had this big storm that ripped through this would have been like august 2019 i think we had uh 100 kilometer hour winds or whatever ripped through a bunch of hail it's when we got it was august 17th we got three feet of snow in the northeast um that year and uh snow anyway, again my tent fly had, yeah my tent fly had smashed open i had rain coming in the tent i'd packed i usually back then i used to always carry a synthetic sleeping bag but i had a little like zero celsius down bag and um and it was just getting soaked and i told the boys like it was right at dark i'm like hey we got to pull out and go back to this you know to go back to the horse camp we were backpacking and they're kind of you know two clients are like what you know they're, they're not into it or whatever anyways we i convinced them to push it to come out i'm like this is going to be a shit shit sleep it's not going to work and we've got like two days of storms coming we're not going to do anything in the alpine anyway so we were bailing out and I remember the one, the one client was pretty freaked out. And he's like, he started screaming, yelling, like, this is how we get eaten by an effing grizzly bear at the top of his lungs. And there's like, you know, it's a lightning storm and sad night and all this kind of stuff. And, and I laugh because I'm like, well, I mean, if you're yelling like that, we're probably pretty safe. So um, keep yelling. Yeah. I've had clients <laughs> like guys that are, you know, fear of heights or, or they're uncomfortable, especially like those moose. I don't know if you did many moose go combos there, there this year, Caden, but a lot of those guys are like, you know, they book the goat combo as like an add on and then they, they find out where goats live and they're like, Oh yeah, no, I'm not a goat hunter. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. not, Stick to moose. Yeah. that's not how, so that's honestly, I feel like most of the unsuccessful goat hunts we have, and I'm sure it'd be the same at Spats Evie, Spats Easy. Like probably most of the unsuccessful goat hunts would be because guys quit because they're just not like they hadn't done their research. They're not prepared. They're not comfortable in that kind of terrain. Um, I would never take a client into terrain that I would hunt personally, or like if I was hunting with, you know, any of the guys on this, on this call tonight, like we'd be able to hunt stuff that I, you would never take a client into, or you would maybe have like a 1% client that could do that. Um, so we don't, we just don't get ourselves into those situations guiding uh goat hunting personally with friends i've had a couple times uh you know where i've taken guys who are new to goat hunting i took a buddy his first goat hunt he's an ontario friend who lived out here for a while his first goat hunt was up in uh region six in the end of february and uh yeah he basically we were in there for a couple days we did one climb climbed i don't even know maybe 1500 feet out of the valley bottom that was basically it. And then we had a bunch of avalanche sloughing at night. And the next day he was like, I'm good, dude. Like we drove from Vancouver like 20 hours up there and, and spent two days in there. And 
yeah, and that was enough. And the other guy we were with, who's a BC guy, who's got a, bon- a bunch more experience, he, even after the first day, was like, no, I'm, that's enough. So, well, you know, so you get that a bit, but. Well, I guess there's something to be said for, um, you know, recognizing your own personal limit and, you know, coming forward mm-hmm. to your partners. Because I think that, you know, a lot of the guys that get in trouble um, fail to recognize when they're in trouble. And then all of a sudden it's too late and weather changes or gear failure or something like that. Right. Um, and the same can be said for, um, at, you know, underage or under um, length or whatever harvest, like short sheep and um, shooting nannies. Um, I watched the YouTube video. I'm not going to name who it was, but I saw a video of these guys, BC guys, and they ended up, they were on a goat hunt and they were having a tough time and literally just spotted a goat climbing up the side of a mountain, grabbed a gun, fired, killed this goat. And it was a nanny. And you know, full well, they didn't, they didn't take any time to ID or, you know, try to uh, sex the goat. And I think that's an example of how some of these decisions are, are poorly made. And all of a sudden you got someone either in trouble with an illegal harvest or, you know, flipping the switch on their inReach to get airlifted out, just, you know, lots of extra pressure, but, uh, anyway, Marvin, Caden, you you guys must have. I'm sure you've encountered some sketchy stuff. I know Marvin has. I haven't heard anything. Here we go. I'll get that. Just this, yeah. I'm going to talk about this uh, this hunt in particular. Just thought I'd have a visual here of the horns that were busted up. That could easily have been my body busted up. Um, it's going to kind of dovetail a bit with Ed's story about not knowing kind of the terrain and behind the goat. Um, I will say just quickly, some of you may have heard on other podcasts where I've talked about being rescued. I've been pulled out of a crevice uh, by Terror Search and Rescue in 1991. So I have experienced the uh, the joys of a mountain rescue, probably my best helicopter ride in my life, um, but I don't want to do it again. So uh, that kind of humbled me a lot, but I still have probably pushed the envelope far too much. Um, and on this hunt, I'll just explain it a little bit more on what happened on uh, on this retrieval on this goat. Probably was about an 11 inch goat, uh, but he busted off. Um, took that goat, this goat in 2014. So I've only taken two goats in the last 10 years. Um, been on lots of goat hunts and been with other guys, but I'm pretty fussy. And this one kind of met my criteria, but um, you know, close to an 11 inch billy, it's hard to turn that down. So. First of all, the partner I was with, um, I took this fellow in the early 2000s on two goat hunts and on both hunts, he said he will never do another goat hunt. And he became one of my top partners, which is pretty cool. Just how goat hunting can grow on a person. It's one of those things that when you're done a hunt, you say, I'll never do it again. And then something about it makes you want to come back for more. So anyway, my buddy Todd, uh, we went on this, uh, I think it was probably about a seven day hunt Um, and new area. I like to go to new areas. Uh, This was a new area, just got up onto the knife ridge. I mean, it was, I think it was two days to get to the knife ridge. Uh, Just popped over the knife ridge and we see two billies uh, bedded uh, about 70 yards. Um, Again, I didn't really take a good look. I knew the train was steep because I had the mapping and stuff, the contour maps with me. Uh, but I just said, that's, that's, that's pretty much a billy I'm looking for 11 inch, um, one mistake. And I've talked about this before and I haven't had the best success at shooting a billy, but I missed the first shot, which would have been, went for the spine. Um, and I don't know how the second one. So every shot after that was not sure where they hit. Uh, I think there were seven shots. Um, and I just it it tumbled a bit it held up and i just about got to it and it did the final kick and that was nasty so for about half an hour we looked at can we get down there and eventually i said i think i can do it i'm gonna go solo i've done a few solo retrievals um because probably the worst thing is i feel taking an additional person on a retrieval who is not as comfortable is actually going to be a worse situation for for everybody so decided i'm going to do a solo retrieval 
Uh, it was six hours. It was a 400 yard descent into some unbelievably nasty stuff and no trees. So just rock. Uh, the good thing is my buddy's a pastor. So he prayed for the six hours while I did the retrieval. I didn't go take my rifle. I went as light as I could uh, and got down there. Uh, found the goat. I think I could, I, I, on, I think that's right. That's what, when I was peeking down to see where, I, if I could see the goat, that's when I thought, when I could see the goat, I realized, okay, there it is. That gave me the extra desire to go and retrieve it. Um, so yeah, it was unbelievably steep, hard, hard packed, uh, where it was kind of a smooth slope, super steep, hard pack, extremely hard to dig in. Uh, got down there, so I deboned the meat. Uh, the hide was totally destroyed. You could see the the, the horns were busted off. Um, so it took me, I got up just, I started at three o'clock, around three, and I got up just nine, nine thirty, just before dark. Unbelievably exhausted mentally and physically. We were a long ways from our base camp. So we hiked over the ridge into a bowl, and I literally, I just said, I cannot go any further. I am so done. So we didn't have much for sleeping gear with us. So we found a little uh, little wallow in the bowl, uh, basically uh, spooned each other. It was friggin' cold and started to uh, rain on us. Uh, so we got a little bit of sleep in. And the coolest thing is we had the wolf, uh, a pack of wolves in behind close to us. So that was kind of a cool experience. First time we've had that like close up with wolves. Uh, kind of eerie as well, but um, made for an interesting experience. So that was kind of that. That's that hunt. I've been on a few others. I think Caden later will talk about uh, one of still one of my top three difficult retrievals was with my son. So that's a whole nother level of taking your boy out who's a teenager into an unbelievably difficult situation. So probably part of my stubbornness, I've been able to retrieve all goats. Um, is I just have a hard time not retrieving one. I just, I probably should have left this one on the hunt, but I just have it in me to, to do everything I can. Um, but yeah, I think I'm pretty careful now. We're getting a little bit smarter as far as uh, when we can shoot a goat and just making sure we know the terrain. That's the biggest thing is having patience. And on this hunt, it's just like Ed's, I just didn't assess the terrain you know, you get excited. You see a good billy that close, you just like, okay, shoot it before it disappears on you. Uh, so that's kind of a lesson, a lesson there. But had a few other difficult retrievals. I won't get into them. We'll leave time for other stories. Yeah, I think, uh, again, it, it, everything kind of migrates back to patience, right? And, and like you said, knowing your terrain. Uh, Caden, let's hear the, your story there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, uh go down two years ago i believe um we were on a ridge and looked down and seen a goat 150 yards um it was blowing and snowing and doing whatever it does and um looked down through my binos just could tell it just uh, it was a solid billy you could see good mass on him and um got down and he was right on top of kind of a a little knife ridge and i knew i didn't want to shoot him right on that because uh if he fell the other side there wasn't we didn't know what was on there and from looking at maps we weren't going to be able to get over there so i waited down till he kind of went down into the valley bottom and um thought i had a good shot there took a shot and i took two shots down there and he disappeared i knew i hit him didn't know where and we're coming down a slope it's kind of a sl slide alder slope this big slide alder um real steep coming down and i peek around a corner and I see a big Billy staring at me at about 15 yards. So I had a struggle to get the gun off the pack. That's another lesson learned. Um, even if you think your goat is down, keep your gun out and handy. <laughs> so I finally got the gun off the pack and chased him down the slope, probably dad yelling to stop running and quit getting so excited. So I don't end up in the bottom of the cliff or something, but um, ended up finally putting him down after thinking i had him down like multiple times and i'm like all right i can get to him and then he twitched and off he went into this kind of ravine of death i call it um just straight up gorge both sides are cliff 
And so he disappeared out of sight, couldn't find him anymore, didn't know where he was. And then eventually I, I kind of moved over to a spot and I could just get a glimpse of his um, white coat down, I don't know how far, a couple hundred yards down. And my young, excited um, personality told dad we can go get him right now and get down there. And he said, no, take a step back. We're going to just, it was right before dark too. And I seen him. That's not quite the words I used. I actually said, you will die. I, <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> actually really firm. I said, you will die. He wanted to go try to retrieve that thing from there. There was no way. It was yeah. like five o'clock or four. It was going to get dark right away. We were physically whooped. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, so luckily had the um, camp was right there. I shot him about five minutes from camp. So went back up to camp for the night and slept on it and woke up in the morning. Uh, had rope with us, which is pretty essential on the November hunts for, um, we were able to kind of scout out a line we thought we could take down on this ridge and got on in the morning and it was about six hours from, or nine hours from where we shot the goat getting down and back up. Um, and it was only, I don't know, 600. Four, we think it's 400 yards. Yeah, it was 10, 10 hour round trip, 400 yards. Yeah. And, 400 yards yeah so pretty much um lowering yourself down with slide alder and uh whatever else rock you could hold on to and then while we were down there it snowed about probably two three inches just to get a nice slick layer on top and so on the way up with a goat in our pack um we were pretty much pulling ourselves up and um yeah it was unreal i mean Ver it was vertical but some timber but like unbelievably vertical yeah and pretty much just as far close to a cliff as you can get but not quite a cliff it's kind of treed cliff we didn't have and, ice axes either so ice axes would have been nice which yeah. is what we do now yeah uh, and just, and we use rope at the end to kind of kind of as an assistant it's not like a fully you're not counting on it but if you do slip it's good to have there so that was kind of how we got into the ravine but it's yeah that was probably our scariest retrieval and kind of dad's age kind of helped with that not killing myself pretty much so yeah <laughs> like like i generally want to retrieve a goat the same day too like now i've we've left two goats overnight and uh, i do i used to work all night to get an animal out but i just find the <laughs> rest like to retrieve a goat at the end of the day in the dark that that would have been a near death thing it would have it was already quite near death and then to do that in the dark when you're totally tired so it was so good to have a good sleep we felt better felt positive um but it still was an extremely exhausting day like i freaked out at the top of the mountain when we got close to the top like with that snow on the ice or on a knife ridge <laughs> unbelievably tricky yeah and i think um Another thing I was going to say is uh, the kind of the mental of that at the end of the day, I was just so mentally exhausted from always focusing what I'm grabbing, focusing on what I'm stepping on. You're not just walking through a prairie or something. It's <laughs> every step is a focus. And if you don't take the right step, you know, you're going to end up at the bottom and not be alive or something where <laughs> you're going to have some serious injuries. So, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I know uh, Blake and I were on a sheep hunt uh, a few years ago, flying, and uh, we ended up, we, we'd mapped everything out pretty well, but we ended up uh, taking this route uh, through a pass, and we ended up crossing this uh, massive um, boulder field in, in the rain, and it was heavy-duty slope, and, and the easiest way to, to get to where we wanted was go straight across, and about... I don't know. It might have been what a kilometer max to get across that. Took us all day. And I said to Blake, when we finally got to got, you know, off the boulder field at the other end and realized like it was so stupid. And we're talking there's crevices that go down, you know, 50 feet, you know, one slip, you break your leg, you're done. And then we got off the other side. And we weren't packing an animal or retrieving, but I just said, you know, that was a day with a million decisions. Every footstep could be the last footstep or whatever right so yeah and i think too like you like you pointed out you know you got all excited you shoot your goat it dives over a cliff now you've got that adrenaline pump going and you want to get to it everybody wants to get to it but yeah again patience right you you right back there 
The um, important thing to know is the, the gun was actually off. He must have knocked the gun even on the way up because we had to climb up cliffs to get 3,000 feet up the mountain. And that's why it took so many shots um, with, with the <coughs> rifle. And that can, it's just trying to be careful with your gun because, Ben, it, there's so many ways to bang your rifle on a goat hunt. Even um, on a mule deer hunt, had it happen this year. Yeah, he did yeah. on his muley hunt. So just mm -hmm. banging your scope and then all of a sudden, a goat, I mean, you, you don't get a good first hit on a goat. You're into a lot of rounds. I'm not going to say how many, but the last few years, there's been a few rounds into some of these goats. <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, it's, that's another thing I wanted to chat with you guys about um, uh, is um, two things, uh, calibers and shot placement. I know, and uh, I think it was our first, the first episode of Goat Camp, Darren um, was uh, mentioning something about how when they get when goats get into the rut that they build up sort of another layer of i can't remember exactly what it was but basically they get a little bit more bulletproof they get tougher uh skin or something happens to them so maybe let's chat a little bit about that um nolan i know uh on toe in the line you were shooting probably my favorite caliber which is a 65 prc uh, and that was a gunworks rifle um we you know the on that in the film, you fire one shot and then there's high five and congratulating. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, that setup. Um, the, you know, it, it is is what we saw in film exactly what happened? Was it one shot and down? And what were you shooting? Was it a hand load? What bullet? That kind of thing. It was pretty close. I will say, don't ever watch a film and expect that that's what actually happened in real life. <laughs> in, in the limited experiences I've had with, uh, you know, either helping produce films or, or being in a couple or whatever, it's, mm -hmm. you just can't like, you know, and it's mm -hmm. one of those things that I think even if you try and be not, not to go on a total side tangent here, but even if you try and be as close to the story as possible, I mean, I think any of us who, who have any hunting experience, you know, you think of your last 10 hunts and there's probably stuff that you would never want to be, uh, you, you, whether it's how the animal reacted, how the hit was, whatever it is, there's stuff that just doesn't do us justice as hunters no. to be put out publicly. Um, so I, I do think it's worth just clarifying that like nothing, nothing that you see, especially if it's in like 15, 20 minutes, that's not the full picture. It just never oh, is. For sure. It's yeah. never going to be. Uh, you know, hunting is like life. It's imperfect. And, and we as hunters make, make the best of those situations. And I think the more experience we gain, the more we're able to sort of see those before they happen and before we put themselves in them. But, um, but no, I actually missed that goat first shot. We thought there was an impact. Um, I felt there was an impact. I was dead steady. I mean, I'd shot, I don't even remember how far that was. It was a hair over 500, I think. I was shooting uh, uh, 575. I think Adam called out a range for you. I think it was 575. Yeah, 575, and I think I think that like was that. line of sight, and it was a hair under. It was 525, maybe or something like that, or corrected 475. Correct. Yeah. Um, so something like that. But yeah, you 575. I think was line of sight on it. Um, and I mean, the thing is, like, if anyone's ever shot that distance, if you have the right equipment, uh, you have the time, you have the conditions. Like the one advantage, I'm and I'm not a big proponent of shooting long range personally. I, mm -hmm. I always like to try and get closer if I can. Um, but you know, winter goat hunting is one of those places where sometimes it's it's the only. It's either a not you're not killing one, or it's going to be 500 ish, or something like that. And uh, anyways, I in that case, like you have a lot of time. It's not a rush shot, like you. You know, you got 20 minutes, half an hour, you can set up, make a rest, dry fire. I think I probably dry fired, must have been half a dozen, a dozen times on that. Like continuously, Kate, crosshair is not moving. I've got my yardage, all that kind of stuff. Didn't There was no wind where we were. Turns out there's actually wind over there. So anyways, I shot, missed it the first shot. Um, but I felt it was a, I felt it was a hit. The, the other guys thought it reacted in a way that looked like it was hit. So it had moved about five yards ish, give or take. It, it moved into this kind of clump. Um, <clears throat> and then just its neck, neck and head were sticking out. And at that point we thought it was a billy that had been hit. And, uh, you know, certainly how I grew up hunting was like, once you have an animal, you know, if it's not down and it's wounded, then it's, 
your your goal at that point is to just make sure that it's, it's finished as quickly as possible um mm -hmm. so anyways we we thought that the billy had been hit and uh it was in some kind of willowy stuff or whatever if i remember correctly and and all i had was like a neck basically a neck shot um so i took mm -hmm. that which is not a shot i would normally like i would never take a you know 550 yard neck shot on an animal unless i thought it was already wounded uh yeah. so yeah and, and that one it just dumped it on the spot so um yeah two shots and then after we reviewed it even right after the fact we reviewed it because we filmed it through a, a phone scope and we thought the billy was hit uh in that shot because it was just the way that it had reacted at the sound i guess or or whatever it had jumped and it looked like it was hit so we all kind of assumed it was two but um much like ed and and marvin were both saying about like recovery distances and times and all that kind of stuff i mean that was yeah 500 and change i think it took us three and a half hours to get over there so yeah that looked uh, that looked pretty gnarly yeah. um yeah, was that a was. hand loop what, what bullet were you using on that no that was um uh it's 140 grain burger vld and it was okay. doing it was quite hot those first hand those first loads that gunworks had that was uh february 2018 so just after the 6.5 prc had come out and their first loads were pretty hot i think we were i think we were 3009 feet per second in yonkey's rifle which is like an 18 or 20 inch so they were screaming that's crazy fast crazy fast for that yeah wow yeah yeah they that's dropped cool. them down after that like and there was there was some um temperature instability there for sure that mm -hmm. we noticed or i guess more with um shooting in in uh more humid climates mm -hmm. the coastal rain and stuff like that but but yeah that's what we were shooting with that and uh i think that's the only thing i've ever shot with a burger mm -hmm. yeah that that 6.5 prc is a great rifle or a great caliber um mm -hmm. and For i sure. kind of smiled when uh and I, i've built a couple of them both in 20 inch and to touch 3,000 feet a second with a 140 grain bullet you are you're you're cooking you're cooking for sure. I yeah. think I was able to get 29 out of mine, but, uh, and Ed shot the old, uh, shot his goat with, uh, the mid nineties version of a six, five PRC and the, the six, five 55 Ackley improved. So, yeah. um, that's interesting. And what do you guys use for rifles, Marvin? I haven't actually talked to you about this. Yeah. So typically, uh, Caden and I shoot the same. So for his grad gift, I got him a two seventy. So, we both shoot, we're old school, uh, two, two, two seventies, but we have the exact same load and they're, they're both very accurate with the same load. So it's pretty handy to have the same, we can just throw each oh, yeah. other in extra cartridges if we need it. Uh, so that's kind of by design. Uh, so I've been loading, uh, 150 grain grand slams in recent years, but before that I used a cheaper Hornady, um, and I was running into some problems. So uh probably not worth going with a cheap bullet on a goat um so yeah go with a little better bullet uh, that's going to hold together uh this last year uh, a really nice guy named nolan lent me his gun work so that pretty that's nice, a nice guy <laughs> pretty nice tree i said Are you serious he's yep yeah. so took it on the sheep hunt never got to use it on the sheep hunt but uh we made good of it with uh, the goat hunt so caden actually uh Took, took took the shot with on the goat um hit the spine uh one thing that i boo-booed on because he did i had a lot of time to practice with it but caden didn't because he was guiding so i didn't really show him how the turrets all work so and i didn't have it zeroed uh, so i just said hold on i assumed it was zero and i was supposed to show him on the whole trip oh this is how the the moas work and get it dialed so if i would have showed them at camp even it would have oh it's at set it or it set it for 400 yards so that was a that was a boo-boo but uh you know he was what you said what was he 90 yards yeah 90 yards and just ended up hitting a spine which isn't a bad shot to spot to hit but not where you're aiming for right but yeah so yeah pretty nice to have the uh the so i've got a you know my rifle's pretty pretty low end it's a 270 winchester model 70 sporter bought it second hand for 500 bucks 20 years ago so now that i've tried out uh you know pimped out one i'm probably gonna have to upgrade is what i'm what i'm thinking so <laughs> something a little lighter as i age right 
Well, I'll tell you, when uh, if you think goat hunting is addicting, wait till you start getting into the custom rifle game and, you know, the yeah. high-end customs and stuff. I mean, uh, yeah. we've got a stock maker sitting there nodding his head. Uh, Ed, what's your... Uh, Tell us about the. Sh I know there's a there's a project in play. What's the uh, what's the rifle? The mountain rifle coming this year? I know it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a six five PRC um, built on a defiance action and the number one benchmark. My my idea behind it was to get the lightest possible build I could when I first built it. Um, but of course, everybody knows my love for walnut versus carbon so yeah i know i've been working on a stock here in my spare time the last couple of years uh so my mountain rifle next year will be uh walnut um not just a regular plain piece of walnut that should glow for a few mountain ranges i think if the, if the sun hits it right but yeah i know i'm looking forward to packing it uh i weighed it the other day before i had a recoil pad on it and finish and it was right at five and a half pounds bare um wow. so i am catching the stock yeah for for a walnut and i've shaved a bit more off it since then too so i'm thinking you know bare rifle i should be right around six pounds um hopefully it doesn't thump my shoulder too hard but i guess we'll just have to see uh but yeah no i'm excited to be packing that around next next year and put a few scars into it and well, builds See, character. Uh, yeah, you know, got to build character. No, no one's yeah. got the thumbs up. I mean, that's it. Doesn't matter how expensive that rifle is; it deserves to be on a mountain. That's the way I look yeah, at 100%. it. And, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, that's awesome. Um, while we're on that subject, um, I'm curious. You know, we hear a lot about goats jumping off cliffs after they've been shot and running and swan diving over the side. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask every every one of you the same question, and we can take turns answering. What what do you feel is uh, optimum shot placement on a, a good Billy? Start with I, Marvin and Caden. Sorry. All right. Well, I was a pretty avid grizzly hunter, so I kind of had it programmed in my head to always take the shoulders out. So that's kind of what I was doing on most animals. Um, for many years is just go for go for shoulder you just want to break them down and stop them from moving that's kind of what i was trained for grizzly it worked pretty well for grizz worked pretty well for goats as well um i would say in recent years more kind of going a little more for the lung and the heart shots um so i know with caden and stuff like that on that one goat caden you put probably four in the lungs um and it worked out pretty well. So, I mean, I, I always like to show when I've done it on some of the training sessions is kind of show that uh, um, schematic of the goat with the organs and kind of looking at that. And, you know, most people tend to shoot, and even I, if I'm going for a shoulder shot, still tend to shoot a little high up on that shoulder. So, you know, everything's a bit lower, especially the heart's lower, uh, even the main part of the shoulder's a bit lower. So you get deceived on a goat, but I don't know. It's always, I'm probably now a little less into taking shoulder because I don't know. I'm a bit of a kind of like to save my meat. I'm a little bit that way. So I kind of would rather go for the lung uh, shot, but more lungs now, but it used to be more breaking the shoulders. Yeah. I, uh, We're gonna... Yeah. Um, deer hunting, when I first started, dad always told me to go for the lungs. So it kind of got engraved into my head and then end up just shooting goats in the lungs a lot and they don't end up going down and sometimes the shoulder might be the better spot but um hit a few in the spine and that seems to drop them right away if you i mean it's not where i'm aiming but usually i end up forgetting to hold low or something and clip the spine and that works out pretty well but um yeah I usually go for lung on the first shot and then from there it depends on the angle and everything like that but depends how he's dancing yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would think um I mean, especially a late season hunt uh with a really haired up billy it's got to be a challenge to try to figure out that exact shot placement um ed what about you uh i i've i've always been the one two guy um center punch the lungs and then follow up in the shoulders or, or spine as fast as you can um a lot of times if you can get a quartering shot a little bit so you can try getting lungs and a shoulder um 
a bedded goat. I've been on two two bedded goats that have been shot. Um, and both times it seemed like the high shoulder shot was the best place for those. One was the, the nanny eye shot and another one with a friend and a billy. Um, and the high shoulder shot on the billy, he just, his head fell down and he didn't twitch again. Um, it, uh, I think that it depends whereabouts you hit him. Sometimes it doesn't kill him, right? So if you spine him, then he falls out of sight and you're that 400 yards, but eight hours away from him, that's a long time for that goat to be laying there. So I, I've always been, you know, try to get some lung, get, get some hemorrhaging inside there, get them bleeding, um, and then follow up as quick as you can to break some bones. Uh, if you can get them head, head on, you know, within a reasonable dif- distance, uh, any animal I've ever hunted, I've never shot a goat in the chest. But I've shot bears, uh, moose, deer in the chest, and it's just uh, they they drop in their tracks. Like not they're not even a twitch after it. And I've often wondered how a goat would react in, in a chest mm-hmm. shot like that. Uh, I won't actually do any of you other guys. Have you witnessed that at all? Um, a frontal shot on a goat? Doesn't look I, I'd be I'd be curious to hear because yeah any any other animals that I've had frontal shots on you know that's that's right where it ended right there there's never been a second step from them eh mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, yeah. no I I've, I've always been you know stick one in the lungs then you know it's going to die and if you can get one in the spine or the shoulders and I keep shooting as long as he's standing keep on mm-hmm. keep on throwing lead I probably yeah, we had- one that's frontal but i honestly can't remember most there's probably been one or two frontals but i just can't recall well i would think on uh you know in a goat hunting scenario getting um and you guys know way more than i do but um, it might be a little more challenging to get that full straight on frontal shot on a goat because you're probably dealing with you know decline or incline of elevation so you're angle shooting um I've I've used the frontal shot a few times too. I mean, Blake shot his bull elk uh, this year at um, like what was his nine seventy five eighty yards, two eighty Ackley right here. He was dead before he hit the ground. Um, but again, right. it's perfect pl- shot placement. You see that with the archery guys too. But uh, Nolan, what, if I'm your client and we're setting up on a goat, where am I putting the crosshairs? Lungs, just like those guys said. I mean. Again, it's it's a little bit different when you're not the shooter, right? When you're setting up, especially when you're setting up a stranger compared to like, you know, if if Marvin's going hunting with a close friend or with Caden or Ed's going with one of his buddies or I'm going with one of my buddies and you know their tendencies or whatever else or, or their proficiency. But in our case, uh, as guides, like, you know, you, you get the guy to shoot on your, uh, like at, at the main camp they fly into, they're going to shoot the rifles. So you have an idea of how, how well they shoot at a hundred yards kind of in a supported position and if their scope's on, but, uh, yeah, I'm a big proponent of just lungs, lungs. And then after that, like, and I tell every client for moose and, uh, and goats basically keep blazing. So until that animal's until on the ground, down. like if they're, if they're in a good spot with goats, same as with moose, if they're in a good spot, you want them to die in a good spot. Uh, you know, you can go from having a pretty awesome day to a pretty miserable day pretty quick, <laughs> whether that's a goat and lots of goats do kick and, and fly off mountains and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've, I've always just been lungs. I mean, I'm a firm believer that if you're shooting, uh, a bullet that holds the, I, I like bullets that hold together. Well, I'm not a huge, like VLD, ELDX guy. I like Acubons, TSXs, TTSXs, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, so if, if you've got a client, you know, or you yourself are shooting a stout bullet, I mean, there isn't an animal on earth that with two holes, like a hole through both lungs that they're going to live, um, might mm-hmm. take it a bit longer or, or whatever else, depending on, um, you know, bullet speed and, and how much damage and stuff it creates, but they're just not going to survive that. So that's, that's been my go-to for pretty much every animal. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm kind of the same way and, and, uh, you know, I'm an old gun guy and hand loader from way back. So if it's, uh, if it's got Nosler written on the box, I'm probably shooting that or, you know, something of that style of bullet. And, um, you know, I've been doing it up my whole entire life and, and I'll do the same thing, you know, try to get that behind the front shoulder, in the pocket, in this, you know, 
right in there and try and drop them but you know animals all of a sudden for some reason some animals just get tougher after they've been shot it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's an elk or a moose or a goat or whatever right so anyway all good stuff sheep. except sheep that's the one big difference one hit anywhere mm -hmm. on a ram and he's going down Almost. yeah uh, you know i've i've been lucky enough to be on one successful sheep hunt but uh, i wasn't the i wasn't the dude squeezing the trigger but i did see that ram go down real fast and uh, that's what mm -hmm. we hear so but yeah that that's a good point marvin it's a very different situation with sheep um you know one of the things i wanted to ask you guys um and i guess it it's a little different depending on who we ask but um I'm assuming favorite time of year, Marvin, I think you said um, you like late October, November kind of is when you like to go hunt. Yeah. Is that right? For, for, yeah. First, my ultimate, if I could do one hunt a year, it would be the first two weeks of November. Uh, my second choice is the first two weeks of September. Okay. Um, and Caden and Nolan, I guess, you know, if you're doing it for yourself, it's going to be late anyway, because you're coming out. When do you guys come out of the bush? Late September, early October, I guess, probably, right? By the time you trail out? Uh, yeah, kind of end of October kind of thing. -ish. Mid October to end. Um, yeah. yeah, the last couple of years it's been more November hunts, but um, done a September and a August and love those two. But the November, just the hides are, the hides are real nice. So, and that's mm -hmm. when I'm back. Yeah, so, yeah but I enjoy it. I enjoy all of them equally, but this November just has a bit of a different element to it. Mm -hmm. And Ed, how about you? What's your favorite time? I don't think I can pick a favorite time, really. You know, anything but yeah. August. I, I, I'm not much for August goat hunts. Um, well, one for I'm always busy sheep hunting, but just the 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 heat, the bugs, everything in August, and, and they don't have much hair on them. You know. Um, I, I really like the November, the hair of a November goat. Um, I still dream of a February Billy someday, you know, for, for as out of reach as it may be, I can still go and look and try maybe. But uh, if I had to pick one time, a uh, lot like Marvin, I think the first couple weeks, November, you know, you're going to get a bit of snow, maybe a little bit of ice, but you're not going to, you're not going to be getting that two feet, three feet of snow like you get in the winter time, you know, and, and the goat's got nice hair. Um, even in mid to late October, you know, they're starting to get haired up pretty good. Um, but yeah, basically any time but August for me. Right on. Um, well, we're getting close, guys. We got about 10, 12 minutes left. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, so we've pretty well established now, um, you know, the best in general, as far as the group goes, the best time of the year to hunt goats is let's just say November. So that really changes uh, the gear makeup um, as far as um, what we're packing on our backs. I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I guess in these uh, late season hunts, um, I'll, so I'm going to flip this to Nolan on again, back to toe on the line. How did the food plan look for you guys as, as far as what, what would be different from your, you know, well, you're, you're a horse guide. So assuming you're a backpack hunter early season for sheep versus that that grind of a hunt you guys did uh, tell us a little bit about that in the in the prep that went into that yeah i um generally speaking like you mentioned i'm a horse guide so notoriously bad for kind of overpacking in general I've, I've never been like i don't own a scale i've got a reloading scale that's the only scale i've got in the house um so i don't i'm not like a hyper way everything kind of one of those guys who's like if I need it and it's, and I buy good quality and it's, and it's lighter weight or whatever, or if I feel that it's, it makes sense, I'll take it. Uh, and you know, I'm young enough that it's kind of one of those things. It's like, well, if you can't carry it in, you should probably just be in better, like be in a little bit better shape. I mean, I'm a guide. I'm, I'm expected to be able to do this stuff. So I've never weighed, weighed anything like that, uh, except for, and I've never ounce counted with backpacking food. Like if I go for a, yeah, Grant Isles just said extra whiskey. That's right. Um, but yeah, if, if, if I'm going on a, on a backpack hunt with buddies, whether it's a week or 10 days or something like that, I mean, usually not really like a calorie counting kind of person. I think, I don't know about Ed and, and Marvin or anyone else on here who's got a lot of experience doing that. At some point, I feel like you just, you're able to look at food and be like, that's a day's worth. 
that's what I'll need for this kind of terrain, this kind of output that I expect. I don't need to count the calories. Winter goat hunting is one place I do. Um, and I think it's been a few, it's been a number of years since I've been on one, probably three years or something like that. But I feel like I usually try and shoot for like 5,000 calories. And I think I was able to get the last time I actually calculated, I was able to get like 53 to between 5,000 and 5,500 calories per day. Uh, and that was like 1.35 pounds of food per day. So that's pretty good, but it's also super expensive. Like it's one of those things, you know, just like chasing ultralight stuff with carbon, uh, you know, you want, you want more calories, less weight, you're just going to be paying more money. So, you know, yeah. like just snacks for a hunt like that. I feel like, you know, for 10 days, you're, you, you're probably a few hundred dollars just in snacks. Cause you're going to like an MEC or something similar and you're getting, you know, ultra marathon running stuff. It's super high calorie, super lightweight. Um, so that's the only time I've done that. And generally I've never really found myself to be, uh, super hungry in the back country, mm -hmm. but also I'm a horse guide. So I've got a few extra pounds. To burn. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> while we got you then what's your, um, for it, let's say it's a late season hunt. What's the one piece of gear that is, is definitely in your pack, your favorite piece that you would just not go without. Ooh, that's gotta be, and they discontinued this and I've heard rumors that they're coming out with a new version of it, but, uh, Sitka had a jacket. And it was called the, um, oh God, I can't even remember off the top of my head. Windstopper down hoodie, I think. The WS down hoodie. I know Ed uh, has one. And that thing is like, yeah, uh, it is just, there's very few pieces of gear. I'm a firm believer that like most of your success in the field is between your ears. Uh, mm -hmm. And gear helps you stay comfortable, but it's not going to make you a better hunter. Um, you know, whether it's rifles, packs, anything like that, it makes you more comfortable. It doesn't make you a better hunter, but there's a few pieces that like that, that wind stopper hoodie. I mean, it's a big down puffy. I think it's like a 70% down 30% synthetic blend. It's got Gore-Tex, uh, wind stopper, like face fabric. And it is just, it's like, put it gets like stepping into Mexico when you've got nasty weather and you throw that thing on. So for me, that's pretty constant, like from the end of August, um, up North onwards, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll probably pack that in my backpack. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I had, uh, uh one of my buddies who's sort of a mentor told me, he said, you only need three pieces of gear and they're the most important ones, legs, lungs, and a positive attitude and you'll get it done. Right. So right on. Yeah. Uh, Ed, Exactly. What about you? How, how does your gear makeup look? You're a sheep hunter and early, I know you like the early season opener and the uh, late season goat hunter. So how does your pack change? What are a few things? When you, when you asked, the first thing that came to mind was that windstopper parka or jacket from Sitka. Um, anytime after August, that comes with me as well as uh, I got a pair of the Kifaru down pants. Um, they're they're always with me after september they're 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 a lifesaver you know no matter how cold you are if you put them on uh you're going to be warm um other than that you know i don't change a lot really um my my base layers stay the same everything stays the same except for my puffy gear between august and late season uh, if i get into february i tend to bring an extra layer of of uh base layer in case i get sweated up or something um mm -hmm. but really nothing changes my boots change and my socks change uh for for winter hunts late season hunts um sure. my, my food all stays the same uh, like nolan i've never weighed my food really um after doing it for so long you kind of get an idea of what what you eat and what you don't eat um I, I eat a way less on a backpack hunt than I do on an average day at home. You know, I'll, I'll snack mm -hmm. a little bit, but you know, if, if I'm going for 10 days, I'll probably eat seven of my mountain house meals, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty easy for me to, to pack food, uh, lots of coffee. I, I live on a lot of coffee while I'm out there. So I hear you. I, I think I think my big comfort item there is sugar. I've usually got about two pounds of sugar for my coffee for every backpack hunt. But uh, that's why you're running up mountains, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. 
Yeah. Right on. Well, we are we got a couple minutes left, so I'm going to uh, shoot to father son here in the corner. If you guys you can give us your short and dirty version on what changes for you and your packs. Okay, I'll go quick on the food. I'm a pound and a quarter a day for sheep hunt. So if I do a 15, 16 day sheep hunt, I'm at about 21 or so pounds. Um, and it'd be the same on a goat, but I'm just at a 10 day. So I'm at uh, obviously a little bit lighter there. Um, but I carry the same food I have for probably 25 straight years as far as what I eat. Um, what we found in the, the, the November hunts, we actually don't hike as far and we're around camp more because uh, we're hanging out in, where the goats are. We're not eating as much. So I'm probably been taking less food and then we get typically been getting goats. So we eat goat as well. So probably lighten up on that area. But if you're hiking lots, that's when you're going to be burning the calories uh, typically. But we're finding we didn't hike as much as we thought we would. Um, I Best gear, I mean, I got, as far as obviously boots, I said that the other night, critical pack. I got probably with everything on my Kefaro, I'm 10,000 cubic inch. Uh, and I said the other night, you you know, you. I never wished, and Nolan said that, never wished I had a smaller pack. And I pack, I have a pack that's big enough to carry, you know, my own animal with uh, the cape. So I kind of like big. Uh, my favorite gear, would be the uh, Kefaro Lost Park pack or the the parka that's been yep. phenomenal. I love that thing. It's synthetic. Um, wear it all the time. Brought it on my early sheep hunt this year in August. Wore it lots. I'm not hiking, but when you're just glassing and around camp, uh, wore it all the time on the the goat hunt. So critical piece of gear in my view. I'm still trying to figure out the best raincoat, but I bought a hundred and fifty dollar Heli Hansen on my sheep hunt or my goat hunt. I used. I loved that thing for hundred and fifty bucks. Right on. I'll be bringing it cool. again. It's not what I hike in. Hey everybody! If you're wondering why the podcast stopped so abruptly, we have a hard stop on our live streams. So we were having so much fun talking to the guys that we physically just ran out of time. I just want to thank all of our guests and participants, members and the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance for working with Spike Camp on the uh, goat camp. If you're not a member of the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance, we encourage you to do so. Get out there and support your wildlife conservation groups. They're the reason that we have the resource that we have. Thank you very much.